Okay. Good morning. The subcommittee on space will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing titled An Update on NASA Exploration Systems Development. I now recognize myself five, uh, for five minutes of an opening statement. Exploration means expanding our reach as humans, as a civilization and as a country. The ability of our nation to explore space is a strategic imperative. Our ability to carry out this critical strategic endeavor will rely on a few key capabilities. We must launch the space launch system in order to push beyond low Earth orbit. We must finish developing the Orion capsule in order to operate in deep space. And we must upgrade our ground infrastructure to support a rejuvenated and an expanded exploration agenda. NASA's long-term goal, as laid out in the 2017 NASA Transition Authorization Act, is to extend human presence throughout the solar system. The Space Launch System and Orion are the strategic capabilities that will allow and enable humans and robots to accomplish this goal. SLS and Orion will enable U.S. astronauts to return to the moon for the first time since Gene Cernan left his daughter's name in the lunar regolith in 1972. As Vice President Pence said in his inaugural meeting of the reestablished National Space Council, we will return American astronauts to the moon, not only to leave behind footprints and flags, but to build the foundation that we need to send Americans to Mars and beyond. SLS and Orion are the tip of the spear that will lead that return. The commercial sector can contribute by supplying necessary services and providing augmenting capabilities, but SLS and Orion are irreplaceable strategic assets that are necessary for missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. One of the first major laws that President Trump signed was the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017. The bill, which originated with this committee, directed NASA to stay the course with SLS and Orion. It also reaffirmed congressional and presidential direction for NASA to utilize a stepping stone approach to exploration, which allows for a return to the moon. I wholeheartedly support the administration's call to return to the moon. This committee has received testimony time and again that the moon is the appropriate next destination for our space program. Returning to the moon does not have to mean delaying a mission to Mars. On the contrary, it is a logical step that enables exploration of the red planet and beyond. And while I'm excited by the promise of how strategic assets like SLS and Orion will enable America to return to the moon, this committee has a responsibility to conduct oversight to ensure that these programs are successful. All three exploration system elements, SLS, Orion, and ground systems, have experienced delays and overruns. This year has certainly challenged the program. Last year, Michoud in Louisiana was hit by a tornado. In August, Texas and Florida were hit by hurricanes. A couple of years ago, the Michoud's Vertical Assembly Facility Foundation was not reinforced, requiring a rebuild. This year, complications with friction stir weld pins at Michoud resulted in poor wells on the core stage. All of this adds up. It appears as though the new issues with tornadoes and hurricanes and welding will cost roughly a year of delay. Depending on whether the Europeans deliver the service module on time for integration on Orion, the delay may be greater. Congress needs to understand where the program is today. What costs, schedule, and performance deliverables can the agency commit to? What is the plan going forward? How will NASA manage future issues to ensure long-term program sustainability? We aren't out of the woods yet on this program, but we can see the edge of the forest. Significant progress has been made. We're bending metal, writing software code, and integrating hardware. 
Given a program of this magnitude, this is no small feat, particularly given the challenges that the program faced under the last administration. In order to meet our nation's space exploration goals, it will take focus, discipline, and continuity of efforts going forward. The administration and Congress must not only provide leadership and direction, but we must also appropriately fund and oversee the program. Similarly, NASA and the contractors have to execute. Failure to do so could have dire consequences for the program, and there will be no one else to blame. The administration has demonstrated its renewed support. Congress consistently funds the program at healthy levels. It is time for NASA and the contractors to deliver. I'm thankful that our witnesses are here today to help us better understand where, we're, uh, where we are with the program and how we plan to move forward, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from California, Mr. Barra, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and good morning to our distinguished panel. Um, you know, this is a, a great hearing and a great time for this hearing to get an update on NASA's exploration systems development activities. NASA continues to progress, but as the chairman pointed out, there have been some challenges um, beyond their control um, in devel developing key elements needed to move humans beyond low Earth orbit and eventually send them to Mars. Construction of the Space Launch System, the Orion Crew Vehicle, and ground infrastructure at Kennedy Space Center is well underway. Major components for Exploration Mission 1, also known as EM-1 and EM-2, are undergoing fabrication and testing. For example, in August 2017, NASA completed the wel welding the liquid oxygen tank that is scheduled for use on the SLS launch vehicle to be flown on EM-1. The Orion spacecraft destined for EM-1 was successfully powered up for the first time in August 2017, and on October 19, 2017, NASA engineers conducted a full-duration 500-second test of one of the RS-25 flight engines to be used on EM-2. NASA and industry partners have not undertaken a rocket development program of this scale for more than three decades. In addition to new hardware and in infrastructure, this has also necessitated reestablishing critical capabilities needed for U.S. leadership in deep space exploration. This is not just work NASA and its prime contractors are doing. Over 1,000 suppliers spread across every state are part of this program. However, a program of this size does not happen without challenges, and NASA's human space exploration program is facing several, including having to man maintain manufacturing, test, and processing schedules as SLS, Orion, and EGS are integrated. The recovery of, from tornado damage at the Michaud Assembly Facility that, that the chairman mentioned. Resolve first-time production issues for SLS elements and adjust activities in response to unpredictable appropriations funding. As the chairman pointed out, independent analysis by GAO and NASA's Office of Inspector General have also identified concerns with NASA's ability to meet projected launch dates. For instance, in an April 2017 report, GAO found that despite SLS, Orion, and EGS activities making progress, schedule pressure is escalating as technical challenges continue to cause delays. GAO characterized NASA's planned launch date of November 2018 as precarious. Part of what I hope to get out of today's hearing is a better understanding of what that clear plan and an updated launch date for EM-1, as well as the opportunity to continue examining other important issues, including the reasons for the latest delay in launching EM-1 and the basis for having confidence in NASA's plan moving forward. Indicators and milestones Congress should use as a as should use for measuring progress made by both the SLS, Orion, and EGS programs, and by NASA in establishing a production capability, and how a return to the moon, including establishing a human presence, would impact the goal of sending humans to Mars in the 2030s, as directed in the 2017 NASA Transition Authorization Act. In closing, Mr. Chairman. You know, you've often heard me talk about 
you know, growing up um, in the middle of the space race, growing up in Downey, California, um, home of much of the, the Apollo mission, and how that in inspired me along with the generation of, of kids to, to think about the sciences and, and beyond. What we're talking about in terms of the systems that we're developing today is a reestablishment of American leadership in the space program as we start to think about you know, going back to the moon and going beyond into to deep space. And that does have the ability to inspire another generation of kids and, and reinvigorate our desire to explore our curiosity about the, the universe around us. One of those inspirational figures um, of the nation's human space program is actually with us today, Dr. Magnus has flown on the shuttle and lived on the International Space Station. We thank you, Dr. Magnus, for your service and appreciate you being a role model for millions of young people. I look forward to the testimony and I yield back. Thank you, I couldn't agree more, Mr. Barrow. Uh, I now recognize the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, your comments and the ranking member's comments as well. Congress has supported NASA's Exploration Systems Program for years. We have showed this support in law and with funding from one administration to the next. After all these years, after billions of dollars spent, we are facing more delays and cost overruns. Recent hurricanes and tornadoes have damaged some facilities and slowed localized progress, but many of the problems are self-inflicted. It is very disappointing to hear about delays caused by poor execution when the U.S. taxpayer has invested so much in these programs. For the last eight years, Congress has defended the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Vehicle from attempts at cancellation and proposed budget cuts. Funding for the Exploration System's development now is nearly $4 billion a year. The Government Accountability Office reported last spring that the first launch of the SLS likely will be delayed a year from late 2018 to late 2019. Delays with the European Service Model module also could push this into 2020. If this is the case, the schedule for the first launch with crew is also at risk because of the time needed to upgrade the mobile launch platform. The NASA Inspector General reported this week that the development of exploration systems is one of the most significant challenges facing NASA. The IG highlighted problems facing all components of the system, SLS, Orion, and the ground systems. NASA and the contractors should not assume future delays and cost overruns will have no consequences. If delays continue, if costs rise, and if foreseeable technical challenges arise, no one should assume the U.S. taxpayers or their representatives will tolerate this forever. Alternatives to SLS and Orion almost certainly would involve significant taxpayer funding and lead to further delays. But the more setbacks for SLS and Orion face, the more support bills for other options. Other space exploration programs at NASA, like the Commercial Crew Program, also are facing significant delays and challenges. NASA has suffered for decades from program cancellations that have delayed exploration goals. As NASA's exploration systems progress from development to production operations and maintenance, NASA and its contractors must bring down cost and guarantee that deadlines are met. To this end, I was glad to see NASA issue a request for information last November in order to explore ways to reduce cost. Moving to firm fixed price contracts for production might be an appropriate path going forward, but only if it benefits the taxpayer. Congress needs to have confidence in NASA and the exploration systems contractors, which I don't believe we have now. That confidence is ebbing. If it slips much further, NASA and its contractors will have a hard time regaining their credibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, let me introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Mr. Bill Gerstenmeyer, Associate Administrator of Human Exploration and Operations Directorate at NASA. Mr. Gerstenmeyer began his NASA career in 1977 performing aeronautical research, and he has managed NASA's human spaceflight portfolio since 2011. He received a Bachelor's of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University and a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo. 
Our second witness today is Dr. Sandra Magnus, Executive Director at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA. In addition to her role at AIAA, Dr. Magnus is a former NASA astronaut and prior to that worked as a practicing engineer in the aerospace industry. Dr. Magnus received a degree in physics as well as a master's degree in electrical engineering, both from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. She also earned a PhD from the School of Materials Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. And I now recognize Mr. Gerstenmeyer for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you. We're living in an amazing time in human spaceflight. NASA and our international partners have had crew members living on board the International Space Station for more than 17 consecutive years. Most high school students today have only known a time when humans are living and working in space. We are using the space station to expose a broader community beyond the current space industry the benefits of using microgravity as an environment to develop new systems and techniques for use on the Earth. These new companies and researchers have never seen the benefits of space to their products and processes. The space station is becoming a place for business to expand, grow, and gain competitive advantage over companies not doing research in space. Just as having crews in space is now accepted, business operating in space will become normal and accepted. NASA has bought services for cargo delivery from two companies and is adding a third. The agency is in the process of acquiring services and certifying two new systems to transport crews to the ISS. These companies are busy manufacturing and certifying their systems. Our partners in low Earth orbit are helping build a strong commercial space industry and allows us to focus our efforts on deep space exploration. Which brings us to the subject of today's hearing, exploration systems development. NASA's Space Launch System rocket, the Orion Deep Space Capsule with the European Service Module and Ground System programs are undergoing manufacturing and certification in preparation for their first integrated flight. Just think about it, there is more human spaceflight hardware in production today than at any time in the United States since Apollo. As a nation, we are building three different crew vehicles, Orion, Starliner, and Dragon one for deep space and two for low Earth orbit. Getting to this point was not easy and there are still challenges ahead. However, we all need to pause and reflect on this amazing time. As we pursue human exploration further into the solar system, our exploration teams are building more than a rocket and a spacecraft for a single flight. Rather, we are building a flexible, sustainable system that will be used for decades to come. With this approach, we can incrementally upgrade and enhance our exploration systems to accomplish a variety of missions, crewed and uncrewed in deep space. We are also building a system designed with modern manufacturing techniques for lower production costs than previous designs. The work performed in support of SLS and Orion has applications to other programs in aerospace. For example, hundreds of requests for information have been transferred from Orion to the commercial spacecraft in development for low Earth orbit. The work on self-reaction reaction, friction stir welding developed for SLS will have application beyond SLS to other launch vehicles in development. It is the proper role of government to develop capabilities for use by all. Hardware to support the multiple flights has been built. Three Orion crew modules, one structural test article, one flown during exploration flight test one, and the current flight article have all been built for Orion. Four major test stands are complete at Marshall. The engine section structural testing is fully complete at Marshall. The vertical assembly building at KSC is complete. The launch pad is nearing completion. All RS-25 engines and controllers are ready for flight. 17 parachute development tests are complete. Four qualification parachute tests are complete with four more open. The data from these parachute tests are helping our commercial crew partners with their tests also. The amount of work completed today for the deep space exploration systems is large, and it is documented in my written testimony. Further, the, the, this government investment in SLS and Orion is benefiting all. We need to be careful and not focus on a single launch date projection, but rather take time to examine the quality, quantity, and future benefit of the work completed. This deeper examination will re reveal the value of the work completed to the nation. NASA has carefully reviewed the work remaining to the launch, including certification, 
And while this review shows EM1 launch date of June 2020 is possible, the agency has chosen to manage to a December 2019 launch. This earlier launch date is reasonable and challenges the teams to stay focused on tasks without creating undue pressure. Furthermore, NASA is taking additional steps to reduce schedule risks for both known and unknown issues and protect for the earliest possible launch date. The cost for EM-1, even with the June date, remain within the 15% limit for SLS and are slightly above for ground systems operations. Exploration Mission 2, Orion cost and schedule are not adversely impacted by the EM-1 schedule. And, and as discussed earlier, the work completed by SLS, Orion, GSDO shows outstanding progress. I welcome your questions and thank you for this opportunity to discuss the amazing work accomplished by the men and women of NASA and their contractor partner teams. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerstenmeyer. And now I recognize Dr. Magnus for five minutes for her testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Mayor, Member Barra, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. The development system of the Space Launch System and the Orion Crew Vehicle are major milestones for our nation's space program, and I would not understate their importance. However, I would like to address the larger view related to the current state of our human spaceflight program and comment on its progress and direction. The idea of what is possible in space has been in transition over the last decade. When talking with the public, I use a model to describe the ecosystem that is today's human spaceflight program. I refer you to the figure on the TV monitors and have you imagine a bubble or a balloon centered on the Earth slowly expanding. That expanding surface represents the outward expansion of human activity. Since, since the Apollo era, for the last 40 years, the surface of that bubble has been expanded only to low Earth orbit in that initial phase, and it's remained there. During this period, the government was the driving force behind the expansion of human activity in space, and this has led to an accumulation of experience, technology, and management operations in, in this environment. Now private industry has become interested in engaging more proactively and independently in this open space, in that development phase as on the figure. As commercial activities mature, it creates stability and a foundation upon which the surface of the bubble, the initial phase, can expand yet further beyond low Earth orbit. For the foreseeable future, expansion beyond will continue to be driven primarily by government-derived goals and investments. Because of the increase in engagement by industry in LEO and low Earth orbit, NASA and the government are now free to develop beyond into cislunar space and beyond that. But at the core of implementing this model are two key questions. What are the technologies, knowledge, and experience that the government wants to have available for broad dissemination to industry 50 years from now? And two, what are the capabilities and services that, are, that the government and private industry, each driven by their own motives, are interested in developing that can potentially sustain viable space-based businesses after leveraging initial government investment. A core concept inherent in the model and underscored by these questions is the fact that there is a need for government investment and activity at the leading edge of exploration during that initial phase. And the fact that industry will sooner or later reap the benefit of that government investment to create and establish new capabilities and business ventures in the development phase. And I might comment the normalization phase we're not ready for yet in human space flight, but you see that happening uh, over the last decades in the satellite industry where there are independent economic spheres active and the government is a customer. However, the government still does its own thing for its own purposes. So if you can add that uh, sort of with a twist to human space flight, we're just simply not ready for that phase yet. And this is the dynamic that's unfolding in human spaceflight, as I mentioned. The model I've discussed is a powerful one, and if it's employed strategically, if employed strategically, if, and that brings me to the important point, and this is one that you've heard many, many times, and I don't think that you disagree, and so the United States needs a comprehensive national space strategy. It is imperative that we commit as a nation with a constancy of purpose for the long term. It is the nature of the space business that it takes time, patience, and constant purpose to make advancements. The establishment of the National Space Council provides an opportunity to create this integrated approach. A committed long-term strategy is necessary, but it's not enough to ensure the success of the U.S. space program. To be effective, sufficient resources need to be allocated to implement the plan. This is something that has challenged NASA in the past and continues today. When I joined the agency in 1996, NASA received approximately seven-tenths of a penny for every tax dollar. Today, the agency receives approximately five-tenths of a penny for every tax dollar. This despite the fact that the number, breadth, and complexity of programs has increased. 
Fundamentally, NASA is constrained by limited control on the expense side of its budget as well, and has limited freedom to adjust overhead, either facilities or civil workforce, whether size or skill set, and in some cases, the management of task assignments around the agency. To execute a long-term strategic U.S. space program in a constrained budget environment effectively and successfully, NASA must be given the ability to make decisions and take actions in these areas. Equally important to the adequate resources is the stability and insurance of those resources. Developing space hardware is complex and challenging, as you've heard today. A program with a multi-year phase budget can absorb more initially expensive engineering decisions knowing that the result will be lower operational cost and hence overall net savings over the life of the program. The current budgeting process and lack of a stable budgetary environment prohibits this kind of comprehensive approach to be used. The transition that is occurring in how humans engage in space has been a goal for decades. Our nation was built upon exploration, expansion, and ex economic development, from the arrival of the first immigrants and settlers to the westward expansion. Across the continent, we have faced the challenges, forged new paths, and overcome all obstacles. As we expand into space, the next frontier, I am confident we can tap into the same spirit and energy. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address this body, and thank you for your continued support of our nation's space program. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Magnus. I now recognize, uh, and I appreciate your, the witness's testimony, uh, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for questions. And I want to thank you both. I was running a little bit late this morning, didn't have a chance to see you before the, the hearing started. So uh, anyway, great to have you here. We appreciate you. One of the primary purposes of the NASA Transition Authorization Act 2017 was continuity of purpose and expressing the importance of staying the course on program development so as not to delay American space exploration any longer. Can each of you discuss the importance of continuity of purpose and how you balance that against good program management and discipline? And we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer. Again, I think it's, it's really important. We have a, a common vision of what we're doing as we move forward so we can build the hardware and systems that can support that vision. And, and we've done that with SLS and Orion. We've built a system that is it really uh, allows us to move human presence into the solar system. So the Orion capsule has applications for around the moon, can support the activities on the moon and lunar activities. It can also support development beyond the Earth-Moon system. The same with SLS. The rocket is designed to really be a heavy lift launch capability. It can support the human missions around the moon, also be absolutely critical and needed for Mars-class missions, and it also can serve a very strong role for the science activities, such as the Europa mission to go up to the outer planets. It can reduce the transit time by 50% to the outer planets. So we have tried to build pieces of key infrastructure that enables this vision and allows us to fit within this architecture and framework we've been given, but keeping a uh, constancy of purpose or a general direction we're moving forward is extremely important to us. Starting and stopping is very difficult in our industry. Okay. Dr. Magnus. Excuse me. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Starting and stopping in our industry is, is really not healthy. Um, right. We saw that with the end of the shuttle program where we lost a lot of our corporate knowledge um, and we're going to see some of that when we start launching again. We'll have to relearn some lessons that we've already learned. But the continuity piece is important. You know, as a, as a nation, we have a little bit sometimes of a short attention span, and, and we end up hurting ourselves. It was already mentioned earlier, there were a lot of programs that we've seen NASA have to cancel over the years. If you look back in the Apollo era, you think of the dedication and the commitment they had over a decade and longer to commit and execute that program. That's really what you need in the space, human space flight. You need a 10-year, 15-year, a 20-year program, and you need to be able to stick to it. I think it's really um, exciting that the committee's interested in this topic. I think the oversight's important to, to sort of keep people focused. I think that's an important key as well. So it takes the whole community. But you have to be able to stick to the right. program, and you have to be able to fund it appropriately so that the intelligent decisions can be made to do the trade-offs with the expenses. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, how, how will a delay in the first launch of an uncrewed space launch system until no earlier than December of 2019 impact uh, the scheduled launch date of a crewed launch of SLS? NASA is an internal date, uh, an internal date is managing to, as well as a date it has formally committed to. Does either of these dates, uh, do either of these dates now change? Yeah, again, in terms of our uh, exploration mission two, our first crewed mission, 
Um, so far, the, the schedule delays, even if, if uh, the expiration mission one went all the way to June, it doesn't really impact where we are with EM2. There's a, there's a constraint that the mobile launch platform in Florida, that's the facility that the rocket launches off of, it needs to be modified between the first flight and the second flight to allow for the expiration upper stage, and there's a 33-month amount of time needed between, for that uh, upgrade of that mobile launcher. So that's what keeps EM1 and EM2 uh, tied together. But right now, the, the slips that we've seen with EM1 don't impact where we can, we can launch the first okay. crewed flight at this point. But again, we need to be very careful that. We need to watch for that. And we need to potentially discuss whether it's advantageous to us to have another mobile launcher available to avoid that tie between EM1 and EM2. But that's, that's the current time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Magnus, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Uh, how will a slip in the first launch of the uncrewed space launch system impact the cost of the program? Again, it's, it's surprising to some that the overall cost hasn't really changed that much because what we've, especially for EM-1, because what we've done is we're really building much more than just one single flight. So as work is completed on the first launch and the first flight, when that work is completed, that work can be set off to the side and the teams can go off and start working on the next element. So in fact, okay. we have today multiple uh, pieces of hardware inflow for the multiple missions across the, the sequence. Okay, I've uh, got six seconds. How will a delay in the first uncrewed launch of the space launch system impact a potential launch of SLS for the Europa mission? Again, there's, there's really no impact there. We can support okay. pretty much whatever the science mission director needs for that mission, and we'll figure out whether it occurs after if the first flight or after the second flight to meet their needs. Okay. I have several more questions, but we're going to go on to the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, um, Dr. Magnuson, in your opening statement, you talked about the importance of having a strategic vision over, over the long period. And, and we saw that when President Kennedy challenged us in, in the 1960s to put on a man on the moon in this decade. My, my colleague from Colorado probably does have a sticker that says Mars by 2033. Um, okay. So we ought, to, we, ought, we ought to commit to putting a woman on Mars by 2033. It does. Um, um, it does you know, give the public a sense of what we're working towards. And in that perspective, as we're thinking about SLS and Orion, um, the lunar mission, et cetera, it gives us the, the chance to think about it in the context of, okay, if we're going to the moon, how does that help us then think about how we're gonna go and take that next step? So in that context, as we're thinking about um, EM-1, in the context of going to deeper space, um, how is the, you know, I'm, I'm sensing that as we do the EM-1 mission, we're learning a lot. We're reestablishing supply chains. We're reestablishing a, a work, workforce and a, and a talent base that will make EM-2 um, easier. Is that correct? Yes, definitely. As we, the first EM-1 flight is to test the vehicles and the systems and the hardware to make sure they're really operating to the levels that they need to be when we put crew on board. And I think as you see this movement outward, we go to the moon where we can return if something goes wrong in several days, five days. On station today, we can be back in about an hour, hour and a half from station. When we go to Mars, we're now committed for multiple months. So I think you see that natural progression in taking more risk, learning to operate in a more challenging environment. And as you operate in that more challenging environment, you need the systems that can support operating in that environment. So it's kind of a natural stepping stone and movement as we use the moon as a proving ground, a training ground, a development area where we can build concepts, processes, procedures, and hardware that eventually allow us to go do the, the Mars class missions in the future. And as we move on to EM2 and send a, a crew up, are we also now conceptually thinking about EM3? Yes, if we're really building continually to, to challenge what we can do. The, the big advantage of the Space Launch System is we can not only carry crew, but we can carry a substantial uh, cargo with us, uh, with the crew. So we can carry potentially a habitation, 
uh, piece with us on EM3, and when the crew will be there, they can go into that habitation module and begin a, a crew tended presence around the moon, which is again starting to, to break that tie back to the home planet and getting us ready to move into to deep space. So you can see that natural progression of where each mission builds on the past mission, we take stronger challenges, we push the team more, we gain the experience, and what we learn from those earlier missions, it feeds directly into the next mission. So each mission builds on each other. Well, and Dr. Magnus, in the slide that, that you presented, you also show the, the private commercial sector following behind. So um, could, you, could you describe how you see the, the private and international community you know, kind of following behind as, we, as the government starts to push further and further, how the, the, the private sector and international community can continue to support that? Yeah, so that goes back to the idea of a, a national comprehensive strategy because ideally what you'd want to do from a national viewpoint is figure out what are the technologies and capabilities that you want to invest in from a government viewpoint so that those, those um, knowledge and those pieces of uh, technology are available for everybody. And then what, is, what are the things that are a little bit more mature that you could encourage companies or companies might be interested in developing? And from a national viewpoint as well, when you think about the international piece, what are those technologies and capabilities that as a country we want to take the lead in? Do we want to be the transport experts? You look at Canada, they've decided to focus on robotics, for example. And then understanding the concept of those priorities, you can then establish how do you want to bring the international partners in and how do you want to help the companies establish um, you know, the leverage that they need to, to build into their businesses. So you have to kind of start with that big picture view that has to be a little bit more government-wide and nationally focused. And, you know, prior committee hearings, let me make sure I'm thinking about this correctly. You know, when we've thought about a return to the moon, you know, I can visualize a, a day where NASA is focused on the science mission. They may look at the, the various launch vehicles that are available in the commercial market as opposed to having to build their own launch vehicle, say, okay, we'll contract with company X to be the launch vehicle. They'll look at um, various lunar landing um, commercial vehicles, say, okay, we're gonna contract with this lunar landing vehicle that will take our, our science project. Is that the right way to think about this, potentially? Yeah, if, if I may, if, if you think about, um, you know, you have a toolbox to build a house, you don't have just one tool and toolbox, and you find the right tool for the job. And so, again, in using the satellite um, business as a, a model, there are economic activities going on that, where the government purchases services, and there are government activities as well. So you need a mix, and it has to be driven by what, are the, what is the strategic view for the country, and what kind of capabilities do you want to create and make sure that you have going forward. So you have to think about it from that big picture. There's a place for all of it in the right strategy. Great, thank you. I'm out of time, I yield back. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the production of the core stage element is currently driving the space launch system program schedule. The program is combining welding techniques and materials, specifically the thickness of the metal that have not been used before. While establishing new production techniques is laudable, the program has faced numerous setbacks as it is developing these processes and correcting defects. How confident is the program that it and its contractors will have gained enough knowledge to avoid these setbacks and delays for future flight hardware? We've, we've met the challenges of the <clears throat> self reactant friction stir welding of the thicker materials. We understand now how to do that. We'll still probably continue to refine the welding technique as we go into future pieces, but the basic understanding is in place now and we know how to do the welding. And as I said in my opening remarks, that's also important to the industry as a whole. NASA paved the way by now allowing others to use those same, same techniques in the larger thickness of materials. If you could, what steps does the program and contractor have in place to avoid mistakes, such as uh, welding tool changes that shut down production? We're again carefully monitoring all that activity. We're looking at uh, ways we can do inspection. We knew fairly soon and immediately that there was a problem with our welding when it occurred. So, so the good news was we had tools and techniques in place to find the defects to prevent that from extending into the flight hardware. That was good. The bad thing we didn't know is we fully didn't understand. We had done smaller samples, we had done smaller welding uh, uh, tests, 
but we had not done of any of the magnitude or the scale of which we're trying to do with the full vehicle. So I think we just need to be prepared as we build schedules going forward to know that these first time things that we have never done before of a magnitude that has never been done before may need a little bit of extra time that first time through and not be overly optimistic in our schedule. So we'll build in some time to go ahead and do those kind of things to make sure we don't have that same kind of problem moving forward. And we've identified those areas in the future where we see these first time items, we will put in place processes and procedures to prevent what's, what occurred in the past. The core stage element, again, which is currently driving the SLS program schedule, still has to complete a major integrated test fire, which is called the green test run. The green test run will have the core stage integrated with its four main engines. The tanks will be filled with cryogenic fuel for the first time, and the core stage will be fired for about 500 seconds. The engines have been tested individually, but not all together, which creates a different heat, acoustic, and vibration environment, and this will be the first for the core stage. What areas cause the most concern during this test? Cryogenic fuel piping, leaks, material stresses, et cetera. You know, the teams are really analyzing that test in, in all its detail to make sure that we are really prepared for that test. And one thing we learned out of this last schedule problem is we're going to have a dedicated person and a team that actually will look at that test to make sure we have accommodated and take into account everything that might occur during that test. I think concerns are when you, when the, the rocket is designed to come off the launch pad and typically fly, it's not designed to stay in one location for the entire firing. So there could be some heat that builds back into the systems. We've been analyzing that in wind tunnels. We've been looking to make sure we're prepared for that. We've done extensive work on the test stand to look at modeling and testing of how we do the fluid flows. We've looked at um, procedures that we bring in tankers to bring in the liquid hydrogen and oxygen during the test in the most efficient manner. We've protected for slips and schedules. But we see that test coming up after the, the core stage gets delivered to Stennis as one of the key tests and one of the key risks. We, we and the teams will, will, will be fully prepared for that test when it occurs. What potential damage are you testing for that might occur during a nominal test of this nature, such as insulation damage, internal harnesses, boxes coming loose? Just what are you looking for? All those things you describe. I think probably our biggest concern is probably thermal and potential thermal damage to the bottom of the vehicle and what needs to be uh, repaired. Uh, we'll have procedures in place to go do those repairs. We'll have alternate techniques that, to fix things if they, if they occur during that testing. So we're, we're actively working that area, and we will have detailed test plans and detailed mitigations for anything that can arise. Thank you, Mr. Gerstenmeyer. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you for being with us today. If I can be parochial for just a minute, in two days, Orbital's ATK Antares rocket's going to launch from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallace Flight Facility up to the International Space Station with important supplies for astronauts living and working in space, and two of my wonderful staff members are going down to watch the launch. Um, and so I'm really proud of the role that Virginia plays in supporting NASA and the ISS from Wallops. Because aside from Cape Canaveral, it's the only launch site in the U.S. that supports the station and has supported national security missions, including a recently announced NRO mission next year. And just last month, an emerging launch, small launch startup, Vector Space, announced that its three initial launches will occur at Wallops next year. And we had an accident there a couple of years ago, and Virginia's put nearly $200 million of taxpayers' money into the spaceport. Uh, it's been a really unique, successful public-private partnership between NASA, Virginia, Orbital ATK. So Mr. Gerstenmeier, as, as we look ahead at future space operations, can you discuss how Wallops can contribute to NASA's planning and operations? Again, we see Wallops playing a key role for uh, cargo uh, delivery to the space station. I think it's also interesting to see how the orbital ATK team is using that uh, cargo vehicle in creative ways. As you see, it completes its cargo delivery mission, then that vehicle can come off the space station and then do another mission for its own uh, uses afterwards. We, we've looked at full sail combustion experiments on board space station or on board the uh, Cygnus vehicle. We actually set a large fire inside Cygnus prior to reentry to understand what 
fire um, detection should be like and what fire suppression should be. So it's pretty exciting to see the orbital ATK team look at creative ways of using their vehicles with a post mission after the cargo mission is done and creative ways and bringing other folks in. So I think we'll continue to see a, a large number of launches out of, uh, out of Virginia supporting that activity and growing in that area. Great. You'll also notice the control center has been upgraded. You'll notice some of the other things that we've done in the times between the flights. So you'll see NASA's investment in the, in the launch site as well as what the state of great, Virginia great. has done. Thank you very much. And Dr. Magnus, in, in your testimony, uh, you, you said and you wrote, and I quote, the United States needs a comprehensive national space strategy accompanied by a continuous long-term commitment for its execution. Do we not have that already? And, and where are the holes in that? Yeah, I think some of it, uh, some of the holes came out during the National Space Council meeting. You know, we have, NASA has a comprehensive strategy for how they want to continue doing exploration, you know, that initial phase of the bubble. And they've been working with the private sector and the, the, the development stage, sort of that middle stage. But there's a lot of um, work that the FAA is still working on with respect to the licensing. There's discussion about the, the on-orbit piece. There's discussion about laws. There's tax incentives. There's, so there's all kinds of the other pieces when you think about what you have to do to develop an eco a, a healthy economy or a stable economy or help one get off the the ground. It's not just about the rockets and the, the habitats. There's legal frameworks, there's regulations, things like this. So, and then you, you also have to fold in the, the piece of what do we want from our international cooperation? What do we want to encourage in our private industry? How do we want to, to help the innovation succeed? How do we want to make sure that the government has its mission and stays focused on its mission? So there's all these pieces that I think they're out there, but it's not clear to me they've all been brought together comprehensively. So connected to that, Mr. Gerstmeyer, as you know, one of the ongoing debates that we hear on our space subcommittee um, is should, uh, do we go directly to Mars or do we go to the moon first and use that as the launching part for Mars? I noticed in your testimony you talked about uh, such a program would, quote, lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration. So is it already decided that we go to the moon first? Again, I think as we described earlier, this stepping stone approach where we use the moon as a training ground to move further out is a, is a good approach. And I think that's consistent with the authorization language that we've received and, and the direction from Congress and the administration. So it's a, it's a stepping stone approach of where we use the moon to learn the things, learn skills, learn things that we need to help us advance. But ultimately, we're moving human presence into the solar system with the ultimate goal towards Mars. Thank you. Dr. Magnus, I just want to quote from your written testimony. Um, the current budgeting process, including the regular use of continuing resolutions, threat of government shutdowns, lack of a stable budgetary environment, prohibits this kind of comprehensive trade space to be used. I just want to say amen. Thank you for putting that in writing. The entire federal workforce, the, the government contracting community, the military, everyone agrees with you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for calling this informative meeting. And I want to thank the witnesses, uh, both of you. It's always a, a pleasure to hear, hear from you and gain your insight. Um, Mr. Gerstmeyer, would you say that uh, reaching Mars is the top priority of NASA right now? You know, again, I, the way I describe it is moving human presence in the solar system, but it's, it's one of the stepping stone approaches as we move human presence into the solar system. I mean, <clears throat> but I mean, as a, as a priority basis, how would you prioritize things? Again, I think we need to be careful and I don't pick destinations. I talk more about kind of building a capability or the expanding bubble that Sandy described where we kind of move out into the solar system with, and we bring um, the commercial sector, the economy with us as we move. So I'm looking for a much longer strategic vision than a s particular single destination. And I see this as a continuum of gaining the skills that we need to, to have as we move further into the solar system. Well, I, I, I really appreciated hearing you use the word stepping stone in reference to the moon uh, just a few moments ago and answer that question. And, and, and I think that Congress has kind of expressed they'd like uh, pretty much everything you do in space to be a stepping stone to Mars, that that ought to be a goal. And, and you know and I know that if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And so I, I'd, I'd really like to hear it acknowledged that 
reaching Mars is, is a top priority. And everything that we do is, in fact, a stepping stone uh, to reaching that goal uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, you're familiar with uh, Buzz Aldrin's uh, cycler program. He's, he's my constituent, and, and, and I hear about that plan frequently. Um, would you just take a moment to share with me uh, why the plan that you're pursuing is superior to the plan that he suggests with his cyclers? Again, I think in our world we often like to uh, contrast things and show how they're different and we try to pick one or the other. If you look at the approach that we've laid out where we have uh, potentially some kind of uh, crew tended platform around the vicinity of the moon and we use that as a staging ground to go to Mars, um, that's very, that has very similar aspects to many of the cycler concepts that uh, Mr. Aldrin talks about. It doesn't continually cycle, but we're using the moon potentially and a high elliptical orbit around the moon as a staging position to go to Mars rather than returning directly back to the Earth. So it's a, there's pieces of what he describes in our plan, maybe not as much as he would like. He would like to have the, the pure plan the way he describes it with a large cycler in place. But I think we look and we look to the community to get good ideas from everyone. We look to academia, we look from our Apollo astronauts, we look from commercial industry. We want to take all those great ideas and put them together and then build the strategic plan that was, we've been describing here to keep us moving forward. So I don't see it as one or the other. I'm not going to say our plan is superior to his or his is superior to ours. There's advantages and disadvantages of both, but possibly a hybrid between those two might be the actual best solution for all of us. Uh, that's that's a pretty good answer, I, and and I assume uh, funding approvals plays a big part in that. Definitely, it, we're constrained by the financial environment. You know, we're we're given you know you know a, a, the adequate resources to do what we need to go do, but we need to reflect that in our planning that we don't try to build a program that requires more funding than is reasonably available. And, and that's a consideration and a concern as we do the planning. Dr. Magus, you care to weigh in on this? Yeah, I would just like to comment that we have to quit talking about either the moon or Mars, because as, as Bill mentioned, it's an and. And if you think about the model that I presented, if we're, in, if we're really thinking carefully about how we're you know, moving that initial I, phase. I think everyone here in this room understands we, we want to go to Mars for a number of reasons as, as, as a launch launching uh, area, the potential of fuel there. I mean, it, it, at one time there was quite a bit of opposition to it, uh, and, and people who were opposed to it that said, been there, done that, uh, have pretty much acknowledged that to go further, that's the smartest way to do it. Right, and, act, and, and, and we can do it to, in a way that as we bring industry behind us, they can you know, expand that development phase out to the moon, the government continues to go to Mars and leading that, that charge, if you will. So there's a smart way to do this where you pass through the moon, you do the things that you need to do there to continue to build your operational capability to go to Mars. The government keeps expanding to Mars, and you bring that economic system behind you so that it's, it's stable and provides the, the additional capability to continue that outward thrust. There's a way to do this. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time is up. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, the gentleman from Colorado, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dr. Babin, and I'll just put up my prop for one second. Um, and to be parochial, uh, in three days or four days from Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, we will launch uh, the JPSS, which that satellite was built in Colorado upon the United Launch Alliance uh, rocket, which was also built in Colorado. So um, each of us, from an economic point of view, but also just from a a point of view of pride has, you know, a stake in our space program, period. And all of us up here are pretty much on the same uh, page when it comes to getting us to Mars. I don't care how we get there, just get there by 2033, if not a lot earlier. And so my job, whether it's a stepping stone to the moon or we use a hyperloop or we, you know, somehow somebody comes up with beaming us over, to Mars, I just want our astronauts on Mars. Orion and SLS are the, the main vehicle we have to do this now. And Mr. Gerstenmeier, you've heard me talk about this, and, and obviously our job up here is to get you the funding so you can have that constancy of purpose on a 16-year 
project. And we don't have that yet. And it's our responsibility to do that. But for me, I'm, I'm a results-oriented guy. Okay, I don't know what the best engineering and the best science and you know, exactly how to do that. That's your responsibility, Dr. Magnus. That's your responsibility, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Me, I gotta try to find you the resources so that you can do that. But others up here are more sort of uh, accountant types and you know, wanna make sure we hit our benchmarks and the milestones, as do you. You're engineers. I mean, that's how you guys operate. So the anxiety that some feel that we're already missing kind of a milestone early in this 16-year journey uh, is something I think we all have to take seriously. But our responsibility as members of Congress is to provide you the resources to get this done. And for you, let me, let me just ask a couple just basic questions. In sort of developing this program, how do you see uh, us adding international partners? Has there been any discussions with other countries about partnering with us in a major project like this? Mr. Gerstenmeier. There's been quite a bit of work uh, discussed with the overall framework. There's a global exploration roadmap that will be published next January. And that kind of provides a framework of moving forward and of which is consistent with everything we're building. They see SLS, they see Orion, they see what we're doing with Space Station as part of that overarching framework. Uh, the activities around the moon where we talk about potentially a crew tended activity in the vicinity of the moon, the international partners are extremely interested in that as well as commercial industry. So we're working with both commercial industry and international partners. As we described earlier, I think this is really a team activity where NASA does a piece we have the space launch system that can take 45 metric tons to the vicinity of the moon, but then we can use commercial launch vehicles to take five or 10 metric tons of cargo routinely to the vicinity of the moon. So SLS doesn't have to be every flight to the moon. The rockets you talked about from Colorado, the United Launch Alliance stuff, what's being done by Falcon, what's being done with the Blue Origin, those can all be used as part of this architecture. So, And we better not forget Sierra Nevada. And Sierra and Nevada, who has... <laughs> or I'll be in real trouble. And they have a drop test on the 14th of this, year, of this uh, month to, to look at their vehicle coming back. All that fits together as part of this inter, 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 uh, interactive framework. And I've seen tremendous interest from all partners in, in seeing how they can participate, how they can be part of this endeavor. Dr. Magnus, in your position with the association... What are you seeing in terms of the willingness by the private sector as well as when you're doing outreach to other countries? Uh, how do you see us building the team that will help us uh, you know, get to Mars? There's a huge amount of interest in the private sector in the United States to participate in this project in any way, shape, or form. There are a lot of small companies that are engaging in space that never existed before. There are, uh, are established companies who are taking... Uh, innovative approaches to how they want to engage in space. There's a lot of energy out there. There's a lot of great ideas out there. Um, I have no doubt that we can do it. Internationally, I think they look to us, our international partners look to us to provide the vision and the energy and the drive, not necessarily to be the dictators and, and direct everybody what to do, but uh, Bill mentioned the roadmap. There's a lot of a lot of enthusiasm to, to have the United States. You guys, you know, this is great. You've got this vision. We all want to take a part of it, let's figure out how we can do that. So we can do it if we just keep constancy of purpose and fund it. And at the bottom of it, it says, we can there, do this. There you go. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Now recognize the gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. D Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's always a lot of fun to come here and listen to the in interesting and intelligent people that you bring to these uh, these hearings. Uh, I have a thousand questions in five minutes, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, we spoke earlier. You know my background as a as a surgeon, so um, I'm going to ask a lot of questions about life sciences if I can. So, what are the special risks, or are there special risks in uh, in deep space missions that that differ from long duration low Earth orbit missions? Probably the biggest risk that occurs is uh, the risk to radiation and radiation exposure to the humans in deep space. Around the Earth, we're shielded somewhat from uh, some of the radiation by the magnetosphere. In deep space, that, that shielding is gone. So we're going to have to go look at techniques to shield the crews and, and look at the, the 
if there's any other techniques we can even do in terms of medication and other things to help with, with radiation during the journey. It's not an insurmountable problem, but it's a problem that we need to address that, that we can't uh, look at as easily on, around the earth as, as we would like. So, so you're already opening up new avenues of research in, in life sciences for these extended deep space missions. That's exciting. Yep. Um, <clears throat> can, and of course, some of that can obviously translate to Earth, too. You can, Earthbound. Uh, so uh, so uh, what, any resting things have we learned from the Kelly astronaut twin experiments? And you don't go too long. I mean, I know about the telomeres and all yeah, that. I think that's the exciting thing is looking at how the, the genome changes, j just exposed to microgravity. And, and we believe that it's a microgravity change that is causing changes to... Microgravity, not radiation. Yes. And, and they can differentiate between radiation and microgravity changes and why certain uh, genes upregulate some way they downregulate when exposed to microgravity. That's a fascinating research subject. Uh, I would have to bring some of the researchers here that are, that are much better versed than myself, but they can explain to you what they're seeing. And it's really opened up a whole new line of questioning. And, and this is how I think science and medicine really advances, that, that new questioning, something you never thought about, you're now exposed to it, quite, it puts in, calls into question your basic theory, then that basic theory changes, and now you're going to develop a brand new way to go solve some problem or, or to do something in the future. So this is a very exciting uh, phase of, of research. Yeah, we look forward to hearing from that side of your, your shop as well. Well, how does this affect the design? There are some interesting design modifications for deep space missions then that vary from our low Earth orbit. What are you doing with that Orion capsule to make that more? It, habitable. Yeah, one big thing is uh, the radiation environment. Again, we look at some potential shielding. Uh, when we, we took Orion on the exploration flight test, we flew radiation sensors on it. When we take it on exploration mission one, it will also fly radiation sensors. We'll also fly a, a mock-up of a human torso inside the capsule, and embedded in the human torso will be radiation monitors to simulate the various organs inside the human, and then we'll look at a radiation protection vest on the outside of the human on exploration mission one to gain insight to see if that provides some protection for our crews. But I think there'll be some type of storm shelter or radiation shelter designed into our future deep space vehicle. Well, we talked about changes in DNA in, in long duration microgravity and radiation. Are we gonna put animal experiments on the we presently unmanned Mars missions? We presently don't have any, uh, I don't believe we have any animal missions on Exploration Mission 1, the first mission. We just have the, the instrumentation and the, the hardware, but, but we, Be we, could, we could look at that. We don't, have a, we don't have the life support system there, so we'd have to put some kind of life support system on that first test flight to, to accommodate some, some animals. But we're doing significant um, animal research on board space station. We have all the basic animal models, which are Or tissue with. cultures, even, something and with DNA cultures. in it, right? Yep. So, so, Dr. Magnus, you have a kind of a personal relationship with radiation in space. Uh, can you comment on this? No, I found, you know, I was on the space station for four and a half months, and I felt like the exercise protocols that we had were sufficient. I came back with no bone mass or uh, muscle No loss, loss of bone density? No. So I, th I think we've got that licked, and it's, I think Bill's right. The radiation is the, the key issue, and we still are learning a lot about what can happen in a radiation environment. I think the, the ability to do some work around the moon will in, in, inform us a little bit more about what we don't know. And as Bill mentioned, give us new lines of inquiry to make sure we've got our bases covered before we go to Mars. Well, you have an excited and engaged and interested uh, committee here, so uh, keep us in your thoughts and keep us informed. Uh, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you for those good questions. And now I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for having to, you know, if to jump between various events that you, you're, you're uh, committed to, and uh, so I, I will go back and look at the uh, testimony we've had so far. Uh, I am on the Foreign Affairs Committee as well as uh, the Science Committee, and uh, I am very interested now what our next major step into space as to what we see it as an international goal and not just an American goal, meaning I, when we're talking about going to the moon, uh, and establishing a long-term presence on the moon. Uh, is we, in the space station, we have uh, people from other countries and, and other countries who have partnered with us. 
Are we planning anything like that uh, for our moon presence? Yes, we are. And in fact, as we discussed earlier, the service module that provides the propulsion and uh, life support uh, gases for the Orion capsule come from the European Space Agency, and that's being manufactured by them. Mm -hmm. And this is their contribution in a real way to the first steps in exploration. And um, do we have, does the administration got, have any plans on this that we, uh, uh, that we need to know about? I don't know that we've, you know, we've we've got some, we had the 45-day report action that came out of the Space Council. We mm -hmm. continue to work on that and see and refine details. But I think there's been a general agreement that international support is a good thing for, for deep space, and we'll continue to build off of what we've done with the space station and look for ways that we can continue that same partnership as we move uh, out towards the moon and out towards Mars. I would hope so. You know, I, um, uh, when I first got here, uh, We've both been around a long time, and uh, I uh, remember that um, my vote was actually very instrumental in the space station. And if I'd have switched my vote, we they would the station would not have moved forward. I'm actually very pleased uh, with how that turned out and how my vote actually made a positive difference. Uh, I would hope that we actually have a plan uh, that. Uh, was a little bit more detailed in terms of mo the moon and what we're planning to do there uh, now that we've made that decision. Because up until now, we've had a great deal of debate as to whether we're going to go right on to Mars and, and how, you know. Uh, and now I think we've reached a consensus that the moon is the step to Mars. And But I need to, uh, I would hope that we get a little bit more details exactly what we're planning to have on the moon, what type of cooperation, if it's an international effort, what type of cooperation we can expect, and uh, uh, how much money, of course, it will cost us uh, to accomplish the specific goals that we have uh, in our Mars mission uh, next, but in our moon mission now. And we have an exploration report that's due to Congress in December, and in that report we'll start to show you some of the specifics of, of the kind of questions and agreements and how we'll do some of these things internationally in that report when you see it in December. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate your appearance before this committee today. We're, we're, we're all united in our enthusiasm for moving this program forward. We all have many questions and very little time. Um, I represent Louisiana. The Michaud facility in New Orleans has developed a, a, a friction stir welding process. Mr. Gersmeyer, could you explain that, please, for the committee? Yep. The, there's a large facility there, the largest in the world, that essentially welds our large uh, the tanks, the hydrogen tank and the oxygen tank uh, for the uh, space launch system. And the way reaction friction stir welds are the two plates of aluminum are together, then there's a spinning rod, and then self-reacting, instead of having a tool behind it that holds the, the two plates together, they're the the pin itself goes through and it actually spins at high RPM and actually melts and fuses the two pieces of aluminum sheet together. It's different than fusion welding when you use like a, an arc or a tool to weld in the fact that there's no heat distortion. It actually just molds and puts those two pieces of structure together. And, and this is the latest welding technique on the planet, am I correct, and provides a very, very strong weld and allows you to use uh, new, thinner, layers of, of steel that allows them to be sufficient and strong, stronger than in the past, and yet lighter. Is that correct? Yeah, it provides a superior weld performance in the fact that the defects are, are typically less, and the fact that there's no heat distortion allows for the components to be joined together and put together in a much stronger manner than they could through another. another All right, thank you. And let me jump forward to uh, man presence on the moon, which, as we 
we have discussed earlier as a stepping stone to Mars. Um, have have landing sites, lunar landing sites, been been discussed and determined? From a robotic standpoint, I think what we're interested in now is if you look at the Apollo missions, they most of those missions were equatorial around the equator of the moon. We see we see potential water or, or at least uh, water in the north and south pole of the moon. That could be very, very important to us as we think about moving forward. If we don't have to carry all our resources with us as we move into the solar system, if we can get water from the moon, that would be very interesting to us. So we see some permanently shadowed regions in the north and south pole of the moon that we would like to investigate maybe first robotically and then potentially if it makes sense with humans in those areas. But as soon as we can understand how that water is potentially held in the lunar regolith, that can be really important to a market and how we use that and how we move uh, presence into the solar system. Yes, sir. Regarding shelter for human presence on the moon for extended exploration, and, and, and extended periods of time on the moon's surface. Uh, one of the major challenges is uh, developing uh, habitant, you know, protected areas where the astronauts could stay. Last month, the, the Japan Aerospace Explanation Agency discovered a uh, large and stable uh, lava tube beneath the surface approximately 300 feet deep, 300 feet wide, accessible through what they refer to as skylights, areas where the, the ceiling or the roof of the tube had collapsed. Um, th does this change the paradigm of what, of, of what you and your team might be considering regarding human habitation? I think it's definitely something to be considered because if you can take advantage of the radiation shielding provided by the lunar regolith, then you can have a, a structure or a location to actually uh, go into for, for storm shelters. That could be interesting. So I, I think that's something that we need to continue to keep looking at and see how that fits. In, and this could be explored robotically, am I correct? Yes, you could definitely do it robotically. We've talked sometimes about having an orbiting uh, perm or crew tended capability around the moon. You could do that, and then you could use astronauts on board this uh, gateway concept that we've talked about to actually command rovers to drive into these potential lava tubes, explore them, understand what's available prior to committing humans to go. Yes, sir. And one more thing uh, regarding these, these underground caverns and tubes, as opposed to on Earth because of the low gravity of the moon, it, it's, been, it's been stated by reputable scientists that these tubes could be as large as two or three miles in diameter. Uh, does your studies concur with that? I'm not familiar with those studies, and I'd have to go research that or ask someone. Thank you for your response. Could you, if, if that information becomes available during the course of your studies, sir, and thank you for your continued research, could you possibly provide that to this committee? Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Uh, they've called votes, so I'm... There, there are several of us that have had questions, and we're going to take a minute apiece, one minute apiece. I'm going to go quickly. The recent slip in the uncrewed launch of the Space Launch System seems to be a result of many factors, which we've mentioned today, hurricanes, tornadoes, the core stage welding issues. What impact will a delay in delivery of the Orion service module by the Europeans have on the December 2019 date? What tools does NASA have to ensure uh, that the European service module does not lead to further delays. If you can answer that, please, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Yeah, we're working extensively with the European Space Agency. They've committed some extra funding to make sure that they can do it from a schedule standpoint, be prepared. We know there's some high-pressure helium valves that are actually manufactured in the United States for the Europeans. We know those valves are having trouble being manufactured. We've sent some of our people to the plant to, to actually help with that activity, to help mitigate that, that concern. We actually have a NASA design for a valve, which we may manufacture and provide for that application. Uh, Lockheed Martin has also gotten State Department approval to send some of their technicians to Europe to actually assist with some of the manufacturing of the European service module. So I think we're doing everything we can. I think the, the current service module delivery date is supposed to be April of next year. I think we're very likely to see that schedule slip a little bit, maybe to May or June. And then we're looking at what we can do to, to help with that downstream. So we might do a, 
uh, simulator on top of the uh, SLS when it goes to Florida to do, to do a modal testing instead of having the actual Orion and, S and uh, European okay. service module on top. But we're, we're well aware of that. Is, that is probably one of our key risk areas. Yeah. We're doing everything we can, but it's really just this first time manufacturing that's, that's causing us the problems with that. Yeah. That is a great concern. Thank you very much. Uh, now the gentleman from California, Dr. Barra. Thank you. Quick question. One of the exciting parts of this is um, looking at newer propulsion systems as, as well. And one that we certainly have talked about is solar electric propulsion as part of SLS and Orion. Could um, either one of you talk about the importance of why solar electric propulsion is important, particularly as we want to go into deeper space? And sure, I can start and Sandy can help. I, I think that the big advantage is that in terms of efficiency and the amount of propellant that needs to be there to actually go move things, it's very, very efficient to move large masses throughout the solar system. And, and so you can, you can move, if we have this, um, this crew tended facility around the moon, it can be in one orbit, then we can use electric propulsion to move it to a totally different orbit. So we can be in equatorial, we can go to polar. It takes a long time to do that. It may take up to a month, but if the crew's not on orbit or with the, with the vehicle, it can move. So I think the big advantage is it allows us to move large masses, although slowly, throughout the solar system, and that's the advantage to us in the architecture. Yeah, I would just add, you know, in the context of our discussions that were more strategic, because NASA's developing this system, it'll be technology that's available for everyone to use. And so it's one of those feeders, if you will, that will allow our um, economy to advance and other companies to take advantage of that kind of capability. And I might add, we just recently awarded some study contracts to typical communication satellite manufacturers to see if they would have interest in using the next generation of electric propulsion thrusters and a higher power propulsion bus. So we might actually be enabling the commer commercial communication satellite industry to get a jump over other foreign competitors by advancing the state of the art in electric propulsion and power generation beyond where they are today. And, and we, so we gain, they gain directly from what we're trying to do, and then we get a capability we can use around the moon for our needs. So this is kind of a win-win between industry and us. Yes, sir. Uh, now, I think Mr. Rohrbacher has, from California, has one question. We just mentioned uh, uh, commercial uh, activities, and, uh, uh, and I had asked before what we thought about international cooperation. Uh, is there anything part of the plans for this extended moon presence that we're talking about now uh, that would include the private sector? And, and we, we know now, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have these private companies like SpaceX and, and all the others making their contribution, do we expect there to be a private uh, 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 involvement and commercial involvement in a way that will help uh, uh, bring down the cost as well? Yeah, we currently have the next step broad area announcements where we're working with five companies to go look at habitation uh, capability around the moon and we're actively engaged with them. They're very interested in what they can do uh, with us, and, and then they may have application for that in low Earth orbit as maybe a follow-on to the International Space Station. So we're actively very much involved with them. Great. As I described earlier, um, SLS meets a unique niche. It can carry large mass to the vicinity of the moon along with crew, but we will definitely use expendable launch vehicles, uh, the new vehicles that are coming online, the Falcon 9, Falcon 9 Heavy, uh, uh, New Glenn, uh, all those capabilities, United Launch Alliance as they build their rockets, all those will be used. So I think what's interesting is we look to this whole suite of launch capabilities and commercial capabilities and how do we build a plan that involves all of them. So just like you described, we do the best of international, the best of commercial. We put it together into a plan to allow us collectively as a nation to move forward. That's terrific. Thank you for that answer. And I hope uh, maybe uh, Bigelow might have a little play in that as well. He's one of the broad area announcements uh, okay. participants in the habitation activity. Great, thank uh, you. All right, so thank you, Mr. Robarker. I, uh, uh, I want to thank the witnesses for this very, very interesting um, uh, hearing and your valuable testimony. And I want to thank all the, the uh, members for their questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from the members. So with this, the hearing is adjourned better. Yeah. <laughs>